Welcome back to Geographics. I'm your host, Eric Malachite, cosmic horror, cyberpunk, and dark fantasy author. And today's script on the Ohio River was written by Larry Holsworth. Check out our links below and let's jump into the rest of this. No one can say with utter certainty who the first European to view the banks of the Ohio River was. It may have been a Viking explorer or a Dutch fur trapper or an English long hunter. History records somewhat wishfully that it was a Frenchman, René Robert Cavalier, Sieur de la Salle, who stood on the riverbank alongside Iroquois guides in 1669. The Iroquois informed La Salle the broad river unfolding before him was the Oyo, a Seneca word which means good river. La Salle gave the river a French name on the maps he was preparing of the North American interior. He called it La Belle Riviere, the beautiful river. La Salle could not have known it then. But he was gazing upon a river that stretches 981 miles, nearly 1,600 kilometers, draining the lands of what became 14 American states and providing drinking water for over 5 million people. The future LaSalle could not have foreseen included the river known as the Ohio becoming the first superhighway to the west, carrying settlers and tradesmen to new settlements in a new country. The Ohio and the lands that it opened and drained to the north and west of its core became the great prize in the battle of empires between France and Britain in the mid-18th century in North America. Eventually, it became the prize of a new race, the Americans, with the native tribes along its banks shouldered aside as a new nation grew into a world power. The Ohio stood as the dividing line between North and South, between slave state and free, during the antebellum era. Escaping enslaved peoples viewed it as the biblical River Jordan. Once across its banks, one entered the promised land of freedom. Communities all along its nearly 1,000 miles featured underground railroad stations, as well as fugitive slave hunters, making it a dangerous crossing indeed. At the same time, the river carried the produce of the young nation. Its meat packers, soap makers, candle makers, distillers, brewers, furniture makers, boat builders, tobacconists, and scores of other industries shipped their goods to St. Louis, New Orleans, Mobile, and other points of distribution. All that really means is that the Ohio Valley and the Ohio River was an early symbol of American industry. Today, curiously, it is no longer a free-flowing river. Navigational improvements have created a series of controlled reservoirs. Their level and flow regulated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as required by weather and shipping demands. Yet the Ohio remains a critical piece of American infrastructure, and despite serving as a source of drinking water for so many, it is considered the most polluted waterway in the continental United States. Its history is, in many ways, the history of North America in microcosm. It is violent, confused, inspired, contradictory, sometimes hypocritical, and often unbelievable. It is both a party of and a synopsis of American history. In the mid-18th century, the three great Western European powers, France, Spain, and Great Britain, were active rivals for global dominance. In South and Central America, Spain dominated, its sugar colonies a source of vast wealth for the empire. In North America, a different source of wealth emerged in the form of furs. In particular, the humble beaver pelt, which is very fun to say, represented vast riches for trappers and traders along the Great Lakes and the lands west of the Allegheny Mountains. In North America, in Canada, and along the Ohio Valley, France and Britain contended for control of the lucrative trade in furs, as well as the vast wealth represented by the lumber trade. Neither of the European powers were particularly concerned with colonizing the land with settlers then with Britain even prescribing settling west of the mountains and in the Ohio Valley. To the British crown, the fertile farmlands there, with topsoil up to 12 feet deep in sections, meant nothing. It was the forests and their riches which Britain viewed as a bauble suitable to join the crown jewels. 
Both Great Britain and France curried favor with the native tribes in Upper and Lower Canada and in the North American woodlands, with France gaining the upper hand along the St. Lawrence region and the lakes. Britain turned its attention to the peoples north and west of the Ohio River, then dominated by the Shawnee, an Algonquin-speaking people whose homelands were spread from what is today central Ohio to Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, and into Pennsylvania and western Maryland. The Shawnee had a major meeting place Place where the various clans would gather, at a triangular point of land where the Allegheny and the Monongahalo rivers joined to form the Ohio River. At that time, several of the British North American colonies claimed the lands of the Ohio Valley under the terms of their various charters, Virginia among them. In the early 1750s, a group of Virginia planters formed the Ohio Company, hired a young George Washington as their surveyor, and laid claim to lands among the Ohio River. A company was sent to establish a fort and trading post at the Forks of the Ohio. When that company was displaced, bloodlessly, I might add, by a French party from Canada, the Virginians sent Washington in his role as colonel of militia to evict the French. In many ways, Washington was a poor choice to lead the expedition. While it's true he was an experienced surveyor and woodsman, he also lacked diplomatic expertise and did not speak French. His bungled mission led to the armed conflict between the French and the Indian allies, the British and colonial militias and their allies, and the European empires, including Austria, Prussia, Sweden, Russia, France, Spain, and the Papal States, known as the Seven Years' War in Europe and the French and Indian War in North America. It was the first truly global conflict, and yikes, what a screw up, George Washington. Luckily, he improved, right? At the core of just one of its many disputes was control of the Ohio River Valley in North America. For the French and British, the vast lands of North America offered not only immediate wealth, but access to the Pacific Ocean and the riches of the East. Neither of the European powers was particularly interested in expanding their holdings in North America. The British Crown also banned settling west of the Allegheny Mountains, effectively closing the Ohio Valley to settlement. But both the British and the French were interested in preventing their rival from gaining excessive influence over the native tribes occupying the land, as well as profiting from its riches. Washington's views were those of a party not recognized as significant by the Europeans. He looked upon the Ohio Valley, which he knew well as an American, a landowner, and a speculator, to Washington and his fellow Americans, the lands of the Ohio Valley represented wealth and power simply by occupying and exploiting them. The French and Indian War removed French influence over the Ohio country, but it also led to the removal of British influence as well. The war lasted until peace was signed in 1763. The conflict over control of the Ohio Valley, though, would continue for another five decades. Following the French and Indian War, Great Britain restricted the settlement of the Ohio Valley. The defeat of Britain in the American Revolution ended that restriction. Americans, many of them veterans of the Revolutionary War and promised free lands in the Ohio region, streamed to the west. From the east, they traveled to the forks of the Ohio and the rough new settlement there, Pittsburgh. From there, riverboats, rafts, and canoes traveled downriver to the emerging settlements along the Ohio. From Pittsburgh to the Mississippi, then controlled by Spain, there was just one navigational impediment, the Falls of the Ohio, near present-day Louisville. The falls presented whitewater, passable by experienced canoe and boatmen, though dangerous to those less skilled in river travel. The channel, as it did through the length of the river, varied according to the season of the year. At times, the falls represented 20 miles of churning rapids. At others, the river passed over the rocks in relative calm. In the 1790s, portages, in which load bearers would carry boats and cargoes around the rapids, offered an alternative to those unwilling to brave the rapids. By the early 19th century, a divisionary canal offered a permanent detour. The Ohio and its tributaries became a highway of settlers determined to build farms and towns, roads and bridges, churches and schools. The natives viewed these events with considerable alarm. The Shawnee chieftain Tecumseh attempted to unite the tribes to stem the flow of white settlement into the valley. His failure, which was perhaps inevitable, 
was the end of Indian resistance in the Ohio country, and after the War of 1812, the region developed quickly. Ports along the Ohio River thrived. Among them were Wheeling, Virginia, where tobacco and glass making industries boomed. Marsh Tobacco, a Wheeling tobacco manufacturer, created a cigar called the Wheeling Stogie, which became so popular, the word stogie became synonymous with cigar. In Ohio and Indiana, farmers converted their corn into hogs before marching them into Cincinnati, where the nation's first major meatpacking industry gave the city the nickname Porkopolis. Refuse from meatpacking created new industries in leather tanning, soap making, fertilizers, candle making, and patent medicines. Between the emerging ports on the Ohio were vast stretches of open land, unbothered by the niceties of civilization such as law and order. Though the Indian threat had ended, a new and equally violent one had replaced it, that of river pirates. Commercial vessels, private barges, rafts, pole boats, all plying the river, were targeted by pirate gangs operating out of the caves and islets liberally sparkled throughout the river and its tributaries. They operated under the novel theory that no witnesses meant no testimony and thus no conviction. Cave in Rock, Illinois became the site of one of the most notorious of the pirate gangs, that of Samuel Mason and the Harpy Brothers, America's first documented serial killers. During the antebellum period, roughly 1825 to 1860, two major changes occurred along the river and its tributaries. The first was the emergence of steam power, which affected the industries the river supported and the means of traveling upon it. Steam led to the creation of relatively reliable shipping schedules. Regular passenger and mail packets began to appear on the river and the towns along it. At the same time, Roads surfaced with packed gravel in a process known as macadam, crisscrossing the Ohio River. Stage lines connected inland towns with those along the rivers. By 1840, the Ohio country was the nation's breadbasket. The lands of modern-day Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois were able to feed their own population as well as the cities and towns of the east and south. The Ohio River provided transportation and drinking water throughout the region, either directly or through one of its nearly countless tributaries. It also provided the means of removing waste in the form of raw, untreated sewage. Inevitably, cities and communities along the waterways were the scenes of annual epidemics, especially during the warm months of the year. Annual flight from the cities into the healthier atmosphere of the surrounding hills became a trend driven by the calendar in the Ohio country, a precursor to the summer vacations of a later age. <laughs> In 1842, the celebrated English author Charles Dickens, then immensely popular in the United States, traveled through the Ohio River Valley by steamer and stage. He was just three decades after the raids of the Shawnee on the same lands, less than one from the last raids of the River Pirates. As for the abolitionist movement, he was walking in history. He traveled from Pittsburgh to Louisville via riverboat, stopping over several days at Cincinnati, where he marveled at the efficiency of the meatpack plants, the order of the city's free schools, and the thriftiness at its rapidly expanding immigrant population. By the 1840s, the employers in the region's factories needed more workers than the local population could provide. The solution was immigration, with new workers arriving from Ireland and the Germanic provinces in droves. Throughout the Ohio Valley, immigrants gathered to work, laying the stone beds of the canals built to connect the Great Lakes with the Ohio River macadamizing the roads connecting the towns and markets, building the new railroads and telegraph lines. The immigrants were regarded with suspicion by those who considered themselves real Americans, which is not a problem today, right? These were, of course, the descendants of revolutionary veterans and pioneers. The Irish were especially suspect given their popish ways and rituals. In the river cities, both German and Irish communities flourished. Dickens found the Irish enclave in Cincinnati an interesting combination of traditional Irish traits, thrift and industry with decidedly non-Irish tendencies such as temperance. He found the German sections of the city to be reflective of their heritage, with clean, well-ordered streets, airy beer gardens, and a healthy, frugal community. Dickens found the emerging cities of what was then considered the West 
Pittsburgh, Wheeling, Cincinnati, Louisville, and others to be free of the curses of the past so prevalent in the eastern cities, such as Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, all of which he had visited and commented upon at length. To him, the Ohio country represented the true promise of the new world, free from the corrupting vices of the old. Slums and ghettos were non-existent. Working conditions in the newer plants, while far from ideal, were not as medieval as in older cities. Though Dickens could describe the Ohio Valley cities by drawing comparisons with the European cities he knew from experience, he could not escape the fact that the cities he visited had not existed just 50 years earlier. The Ohio Valley was just five decades removed from being ruled by Tomahawk and Treaty. Dickens also observed the temperance and abolitionist societies he encountered in the Ohio country, including stops along the Underground Railroad. He described the conditions encountered by the enslaved peoples as they fled to the north, escorted by conductors eluding both the legal authorities and the hired slave hunters determined to prevent their escapes. The Ohio River became the symbol of freedom, the River Jordan. Dickens published his observations regarding the United States and Americans in his American Notes in 1842, which offended many of his former admirers. He was unsparing in his criticisms of American habits, such as chewing tobacco and expectorating its juice in public, which just means to spit. The imposition of temperance rules restricting alcohol in public houses, and the rough and tumble accommodations afforded travelers in all conveyances from coaches to riverboats. Yet he was also deeply impressed by the industry and inventiveness he observed along the Ohio River, and was lavish in his praise, becoming one of the first to observe the river served as a border between industrial north and bucolic south, in culture as well as in geography. Two decades after Dickens' visit, America faced the seemingly inevitable tragedy of civil war. During the Civil War, the Ohio River became a battleground, one on which troops and supplies from the industrial north could be easily shipped to the armies in the field. During the war, steamboats and U.S. Navy warships dominated the Ohio and its tributaries, both north and south. Following the Civil War, the river and the Ohio Valley continued to be heavily industrialized in some areas, rural in others, and a critical component of the national economy nonetheless. The Ohio River towns and travel described by Charles Dickens in his American Notes in his novel Martin Chuzzlewit vanished from history, but their importance to America's future remained intact. Though the Ohio River had, by 1865 and the end of the Civil War, long served as a major commercial highway, it had not always been a reliable one. The river, despite its status as the largest tributary of the Mississippi River, did not always flow freely. Naturally shallow during hot, dry periods, the Ohio River frequently all but dried up in some places. During the summer months, even those areas where the river flowed freely were often dangerous, as hidden sandbars and sunken stumps threatened the bottoms of boats and barges. During the Civil War, raids across the river by Confederate cavalry and irregular troops frequently took advantage of previously unknown fords and passes created by unique meteorological events. Post-war, the U.S. government undertook steps to improve navigating of the river, using the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The idea of keeping the river navigable year-round was appealing to industry, particularly those responsible for the shipping of coal from its sources in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Ohio, and elsewhere to the deep water ports of the South. From Pittsburgh to Louisville, the Ohio River was divided into 20 districts, each dammed by the Corps of Engineers, creating 20 reservoirs that can be combined with the reservoir to either side as the Corps deemed necessary. The dams are raised and or lowered as necessary, taking into account water contributed by tributaries within the reservoir and natural rainfall tables to maintain an average depth in the main channel of the river of about 15 feet. The Ohio River became a major shipping thoroughfare just as the Second Industrial Revolution and the Age of Steel dawned in the late 19th and early 20th century America. Its importance to American manufacturing was evident when the United States entered the First World War war in 1917. Besides raw materials and foodstuffs grown in the Midwest, the Ohio River shipped 
furnished goods from factories to the ports of the Gulf of Mexico. Among them barged on the river were railroad locomotives and rail cars, airplanes, trucks, and other vehicles, cannons, finished ammunition, rifles and handguns, and uniforms and boots. The importance of the Ohio River to the war effort did not go unnoticed by America's enemies. Instead, the Germans took note of the critical nature of the Ohio to the war effort. And when World War II began, good old WII, they launched an espionage plan which included extensive attacks on the infrastructure of the Ohio River. These plans were thwarted by German betrayal and FBI action. The Ohio River again played a significant role in the war effort, both supplying raw materials and finished goods to the military and to America's allies for the duration of the war. During and following the war, modernization of the Ohio River continued, including dredging to widen and stabilize the main channels, rebuilding of bridges, improvements on wharves, piers, and warehouses, and modernization of shipping terminals. Intermodal shipping, the containerization of shipping using trucks, barges, ships, and railroads again changed the river's commercial role in the American economy. Shipment of fuels became a priority in the late 20th century, including kerosene, gasoline, and more recently, liquefied natural gas. And these were shipped by barge to distribution centers along the river. After two centuries of continued service, the Ohio River is polluted. Badly polluted, one might say. So badly, in fact, that since 2001 it has annually been designated as the most polluted waterway in the United States. Despite that dubious distinction, it still serves as a source of drinking water for over 5 million people across more than half a dozen states, which is just so great to learn. Rather than La Belle Riviere, or Beautiful River, it has become La Riviere Paloui, or Polluted River. It does not appear to be destined for improvement anytime soon, either. Over 90% of the nitrate pollutants present in the river are the result of agricultural runoffs. They're herbicides and pesticides that have made American farm production the envy of the agricultural world. Other pollutants considered to be at dangerous levels are the heavy metals, lead and mercury, as well as acids used in the manufacture of Teflon, which have been just dumped into the river and its tributaries throughout the 20th century. More recently, toxic wastewater created during the fracking process has been added to the stew of chemicals threatening the Ohio River. And this should uh, seriously color the fact that the Ohio River is the site of recreational use of waterways for millions of Americans. It is popular for sport fishing, boating, canoeing, kayaking, water skiing, camping, and dozens of other activities that allow extensive exposure to its waters, which is just great for the skin I hear. Despite being aware of the hazards posed by the river's water quality for decades, relatively little has been done to improve the situation. In many ways, it's just gotten worse since the beginning of the 21st century. On April 18th, 2023, American Rivers announced the Ohio River had made the list of the 10 most endangered rivers in the United States for the first time, coming in at number two. The greatest threat to the river was described as pollution which should be obvious at this point. In particular, the leakage of toxins into the river as a result of a train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, on February 3rd of that year. Political posturing and the denial of the extent of the disaster had prevented cleanup from even starting, with conservatives denying the level of the damage and its long-term effects. In the third decade of the 21st century, the Ohio River continues to roll along, marking the days slowly as it flows to the south and west, carrying the drainage of 14 states to the Mississippi at Cairo, Illinois. It continues to carry the weight of American history, of Lewis and Clark and Daniel Boone, and the opening of the west of Mark Twain, and the birth of American commerce the Mason-Dixon line, and the Old South. Yet today it is more of a modern invention than a link to American history. Its water level is controlled by human manipulation, its flow established by the Corps of Engineers' demands. It is still more than capable of overflowing its banks and generating ravaging spring floods, as it did most recently in 1997 when it reached a crest of 64.7 feet in March, placing much of Cincinnati underwater. After all, the Ohio River was dammed to maintain year-round navigation, not flood control, given that serious flooding has been a generational event rather than a frequent threat. 
Whether the river can be cleaned, let alone whether it will, remains a major challenge to its future and to the region which it serves. In modern America, clean drinking water has become almost solely a political issue rather than a health or aesthetic issue. Similarly, the use of water systems for recreation has become an issue to be decided by voters at the polls rather than communities at their beaches and riverbanks. That the Ohio River is desperately challenged by pollutants and climate change is clear. Whether the government has any role in cleaning it up and dealing with the changes is less defined. In the interim, nothing is done, even regarding reducing the level of pollutants entering the water. Yet, the river is still there, just as it was on the day long ago when La Salle stood on its banks and observed just a short section of its nearly 1,000 mile length. It still flows, its meandering course from the forks at Pittsburgh to the confluence with the Mississippi at Cairo, Illinois. It was untroubled by La Salle watching it then, and it was equally untroubled by anyone watching it now. It just keeps rolling along. So I hope you found this video as informative and alarming as I did. And if you'd like another video detailing the historic Ohio River flood of 1937, drop a comment down below and we'll get on it. Until next time, I've been your host, Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy. Bye -bye.